the challenges that so many of us are facing after nearly a year of this constant challenge and constant changes to how we live, work, learn, connect, even buy our groceries, all of this and so much more has affected our sense of well-being. Grief and loss and losing loved ones and friends to COVID-19 and even just reading the numbers of new cases and deaths on a daily basis worries about keeping ourselves and those we care about healthy and safe. That's just overwhelming. It, it is just so unexpected, even at this, this far into it. So today our conversation is about mental health. Before we get started with our wonderful guests, I'm gonna ask you to post your questions and comments in the chat box. And then we'll have time for those after our conversation today. We're recording this meeting today, our gathering, and you'll get the link as soon as the episode is posted. Everyone's welcome is captioned. So click on the CC link at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click on subtitles and that will bring up the subtitles for today. You can also now find our past episodes at jkidaccess.org slash everyone's welcome. So when you're snowed in or you're ice colded in, pop on, pop on one of our conversations. Just a suggestion. Everyone's Welcome is a partnership between Gabby's organization, Jewish Learning Venture in Philadelphia, and my organization, Inclusion Innovations, which is based in Minneapolis. Gabby and I are both moms of sons who live with, dis with disabilities, and we have navigated many systems, and we've really navigated the attitudes. We've both led community inclusion initiatives in our respective Jewish communities, and we're contributors to the growing interfaith inclusion movement. Both of us are published authors, speakers, and since last May, webinar co-hosts. That's right. As you know, many of you who are here, February is Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance, and Inclusion Month, JDAME. JDAME is a unified effort among Jewish organizations worldwide to raise awareness and foster acceptance and inclusion of people with disabilities and mental health conditions and those who love them. Increasingly, faith communities of many different traditions are devoting sacred time and space this month to address inclusion and belonging. Supporting people who are living with mental health conditions has always been important, but now more than ever, faith communities are seeking resources, partnerships, and advice. And so our guests today, Dave Eckert and Gabby Spat, will address this growing concern. Can I tell you a little bit about both of these amazing people? And I was recollecting with Dave, who lives here in the greater Philadelphia where I am, that a year ago, our last in-person gathering was a, a conversation like this in person with Dave. Dave Eckert is the director of Intersect, an initiative within Access Services that supports those at the intersection of faith and mental health through consultation, training, and the fostering of collaboration between faith communities and mental health providers. He spent 19 years working for Access within various roles, including director of a mobile psychiatric rehabilitation program and as an agency chaplain. In addition, Dave has been in the role of associate pastor of Grace Community Church in Chalfot, Pennsylvania for the last 13 years. Dave is a graduate of Caring University and Mission Seminary, holding degrees in social work, biblical studies, and divinity. Dave currently serves on the boards of the Pennsylvania Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services and the Lakeside Educational Network. He lives with his wife and three children in Montgomery County, PA. Uh, Dave, is, Dave is a neighbor of mine, that's where I'm located. And Gabrielle, Gabby Leon Spat, is a genuine connector who's passionate about bringing people and organizations together to accomplish big dreams. A personal tragedy led Gabby to start volunteering with the Blue Dove Foundation, an Atlanta-based nonprofit focusing on mental health and substance abuse education, outreach, and awareness through a Jewish lens. 
Gabby transitioned from board member to staff member in April 2019 and is now the executive director. She devotes her time to her professional role uh, along with community engagement through different leadership roles inside and outside the Jewish community. So as Shelley said, we are just blessed to have you both here. Indeed. We're gonna, we'll start, um, Dave, we're gonna, we're gonna talk with you first about your work and then Gabby will talk to you about your work. And we'll um, then probably weave things together. And so hopefully uh, when we're done with our questions, we can have a bit of a conversation and we will have questions and comments, I'm sure from our, our guests. So Dave, what can faith communities do? Oops, nope, that's the last question. <laughs> And how it came up first, I don't know. <laughs> what drew you to the work that you're doing at the intersection of faith, spirituality, and mental health? Uh, well, it is a little bit of what was mentioned by Gabby in my bio, is that after I was basically living in two worlds for a number of years, where I'm living in the public mental health system, uh, doing, you know, psychiatric rehabilitation work. Meanwhile, I'm also serving as a pastor. And when you live in those two worlds over the years, you begin to see things that are missing in each world in terms of being holistic. So I was seeing that the public mental health system could do a better job at paying attention to the spiritual dimension of people they were serving. And I saw that the church and faith communities in general could do a better job at walking well with people who experience mental health struggles. So it was within that context that we started Intersect to try to support people at the intersection of faith and mental health, bringing together those two worlds and seeing how fostering of collaboration between those two worlds and supporting each of them to be more holistic could be helpful to the common good uh, within society in general. So that's kind of living in those two worlds is what brought me into this work. Great, well, I'm glad you're there. <laughs> Believe me, I've learned so much from you too, Dave, in our in our meetings together. The feeling is mutual. And thank you also, I should say, for having me today in this conversation. I appreciate it. We're honored. So Dave, what are some of the challenges that people are facing? And particularly now, it's been almost a year since we've begun really adapting to the demands of living healthily, healthy and safely, particularly. Yeah, the two I'm seeing the most, you know, one might be particularly obvious, which is the loss of community. Because even as, for example, our faith communities may still be gathering in virtual ways, there are people who maybe don't have access to laptops, to you know, smartphones, who aren't able to engage community in that way. Or maybe the communities of faith are gathering with masks and social distancing, but there's people that we serve in our public mental health system who don't have transportation. And people who would typically provide that transportation may not feel comfortable doing so because of the risk with COVID. So we're seeing uh, challenges to access to just community in general, but also I would say the loss of healthy rhythms where things that people just were doing to kind of bring, put themselves in a place of wellness that often did involve other people. Um, those rhythms have been changed. Those rhythms related to going to work, those rhythms related to who they get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would say the loss of community and the loss of rhythm, as well as probably the loss of hope, especially living within the political context that we do with so much friction and not knowing when the pandemic is going to end uh, those three losses, I think, have mounted one on top of the other, and it's impacted people's mental health and wellness. It, I think that particularly now, people who maybe never had any type of mental health condition have, you know, it's, it's impacted everyone. And it's maybe a good time to start thinking about you know, all the people who live with a mental health condition, who also want to be part of the community, who also want to belong. Maybe the timing is a little more open now. 
Yeah, I would definitely but, say that mental health as just a category of thought is something I'm hearing more about, not just in the places you typically hear about it, but among people who would never have thought of themselves as having to struggle with their mental health. So while you, on the one hand, have an increased number of people entering into the mental health system, you also see a lot of people who aren't in that system who were saying, I'm just struggling. And how do I get help? Because I'm not used to this being a dimension of my life I've had to pay attention to before. Yeah. Wow. Well, so let's talk about Intersect. And how, how does Intersect support faith communities as well as people with lived experiences of mental health conditions? Sometimes we're acting as a connector because sometimes people in faith communities say we want to make, you know, we want to get more help, but I don't want to refer any of the people within my congregation because I don't, tr I don't know who to trust. I don't know that the faith of my congregant is going to be respected by the mental health professional. So sometimes it's us trying to help a faith community know who can you trust? Who does see people holistically and will help you to be able to navigate the system of care? And then other times it's supporting people in the system who are saying, I want to get connected to a faith community, but I don't know which faith community is the right one for me. And by having a sense of what those faith communities are that are out there that that do have a passion and a heart to walk with people well who are struggling with their mental health, we can connect people we serve in the system to them. So sometimes it's doing the work of being a connector. Other times it's doing the work of being a consultant. So I've had faith leaders call me and just say, there's, you know, I tell one story of a person who said, a pastor who said, someone in my congregation is hearing voices. And I'm thinking about asking him not to come back until the voices go away. And that would cause a lot of us at first to go, you know, what? what, what decision are you making? But actually this had happened not too long after the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. And this pastor was very afraid that this uh, hearing voices, these symptoms could result in violence. Now we had to help him think through that better and see how actually community was really helpful to this person. But it, it, what it reminded me of is the importance of faith leaders knowing who are my conversation partners? Who can I reach out to when I've just got a question about uh, an issue of mental illness and how it's exhibiting itself with someone in my congregation? And whether I should make a referral, whether I don't need to make a referral, what decisions I should make, just having a person as a conversation partner can be really helpful. So we act as a connector, we act as a conversation partner, and then also as a trainer where we try to come in and provide training that integrates people's faith with the uh, area of mental illness. Because sometimes people think those two issues aren't connected at all, that faith isn't, or they don't realize that their faith can be a resource for their mental health, rather than two separate categories that need to stay far apart because of some ways in which earlier psychiatric perspectives kind of held faith at a distance. Uh, we've tried to be able to show how the two can be integrated in a way that helps both mental health professionals and those of us in the faith community. It's a tall order yeah. and it's an important order. Just, I just had a conversation um, with Emily Dana, who I think is, is on, is, watching this webinar we were talking yesterday about seminary and the the really the lack of resources for clergy in you know in their studies on disability and mental health and is, is that something that you're that you've been part of or have you having yeah. you know gone through that yourself as a pastor yeah, I would agree that there's definitely a need for more resources and more opportunities. I am encouraged that I think sometimes it's simply that because professors or clergy haven't been adequately trained, they don't know who to tap to necessarily help out. 
Um, but once they do have a relationship built, opportunities and open doors start coming. So I had an opportunity last year to speak to a number of seminarians at uh, where I went to seminary, Missio Seminary in Philadelphia. Uh, and we were able to talk both about um, clergy and their own mental health, because we've seen that be an issue. I mean, it's always been an issue, but in recent years, uh, we've seen a number of people struggling with their mental health where it's resulted in suicide uh, for clergy. So we were able to talk about mental health and clergy, but then also how do you as a faith leader, you know, in your congregation provide leadership around this area? Uh, and there's another university that I've been talking to about doing classes. So I would say, I think it's just more important than ever that we build relationships with different educational institutions, because once we build those relationships, it, it may provide open doors for them to say, wow, actually, if you're someone who can handle this and can hold together faith and this area of mental health, um, then we would love to have you come and help out. So I think work like you're doing uh, with just promoting the conversation, I think we'll begin to see more and more of a of an impact in those spaces. From your mouth to God's ears, as we say. <laughs> um, I think what we're gonna do, uh, Gabby kaplan Mayer, I think we're gonna save that last question maybe to have a conversation between Dave and Gabby. So, Sounds perfect to me, Shelley. Take it away. Okay, so I get to talk with the other Gabby and um, I saw one comment and we'll we'll invite your comments and questions as Shelly said to have a, a conversation uh, at the end but Gabby I'm hoping we can go to that starting place that um, Shelly shared with Dave which is asking you what drew you to the work that you're doing at that same intersection of faith spirituality mental health and I know in your case very also very focused on substance abuse. Yeah, so thanks Gabby. It's it's fun to to be here and, and Shelly, thank you for the invitation from both of you and you know acknowledging JDAME Jewish Disabilities Awareness and Inclusion Month this month. This is actually the second mental health conversation I've had this week and it's only Tuesday at you know 1 20 p.m Eastern um, regarding mental health during this month. So you know it's really great to see the community bringing mental health in to this conversation this month too um, and including it, you know, so we're glad to be a part of it. I'm glad to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. Uh, when I think of what brought me into this topic, you know, finding the intersection between mental health, faith, spirituality is actually two separate things that came together for me. My background's very different than Dave's. Um, I do not have a mental health background. Um, it's something I've acquired and been a part of for the last two years. What brought me to the mental health side of the conversation was actually losing my younger sister um, three and a half years ago to an opioid overdose. And you know she struggled with bipolar disorder and really suffered silently. Wouldn't ask for help, wouldn't you know, be honest. And so it's, um, you know, something afterwards that I thought a lot about. And the only way that I know how to make a difference is to do. And so, you know, I'm fortunate that this organization existed and, and get to be a part of it. And then on the faith and spirituality side, I have always been involved in interfaith work for the last 11 years um, in other organizations. It's something I love. It's something I'm passionate about learning and understanding how other faiths look at different things, learning from other faiths. And so I, I'm really lucky that my everyday work brings the two together and I get to experience that. And, and that's really special to me. Um, you know, our work is through a Jewish lens. So that's our, our real focus. And we look at the Jewish faith, spirituality, religion, culture, you know, however someone identifies to look for that connection as a way of learning, of healing, of connecting, right, of bringing community together, of, of guidance 
from our Jewish rituals, from our Jewish texts, from our Jewish prayers, you know, and um, Blue Dev, we love these conversations. In fact, in, I think it was October, 2019, we actually hosted in Atlanta an interfaith mental health conversation where we brought different faith leaders with different backgrounds together and asked individuals, how do you think about this? Where do you find the intersection of faith and mental health with your respective um, faith? And it was incredible to learn. And the audience was very diverse. We had different partners. And I remember two clinicians coming up to me afterwards and they said, thank you for doing this. I forgot how important faith can be in treatment of my clients. And I'm going to bring that back into the conversation. I'm going to offer them that. And I, you know, for me, <laughs> hearing those two individuals say that was, you know, a, a really successful program. And I think people, you know, if, if you don't have a strong faith background or spirituality background, it, it can disappear. And being reminded of that and giving you some guidance can be really helpful. Thank you. It's such a beautiful um, memory of that conference and the potential of learning from people of all faiths. And Gabby, thank you for sharing about your personal way into this work. Um, similar to, to the question Shelley asked Dave, what especially are you seeing during the pandemic, during this time where mental health challenges, substance abuse challenges may be coming forward in a way that they, they didn't otherwise? Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, one of the things that we're seeing is a conversation taking place like it really hasn't before across the country when it comes to mental health um, on all different levels, right? Um, so it's unfortunate that it took the last year, I think, to bring this topic to life, but I am so grateful that it is and that there have been programs you know, brought to, to us. Um, I don't think the Jewish community is any different than any other faith you know, community, um, but within my community that I work in the Jewish community, we are seeing the conversations take place so much more often on all different levels from funder levels to clinician levels to agency levels, which you know I also think is incredible to see. Um, as our organization, we have seen and been inundated with requests from individuals, requests from organizations. How do I approach this topic, right? With my congregation, with my members, with my community. We haven't done it before. We don't know where to start. We're not educated on how to talk about this, but we want to be. We want to open the conversation. And so it's, that's been really eye-opening. And you know, as an organization, we have grown exponentially. We have grown in terms of staff, in terms of what we produce, what we put out, um, and on our partners, our workshops that we're providing. And so you know, for us, it's seeing the need and recognizing it, I think, more now than ever. And there are organizations that we look at, you know, the CDC has done some different studies where they've compared the number of people who are experiencing mental health struggles and depressive episodes from 2020 to 2019. They've doubled, they've tripled in different areas. You know, suicide rates are increasing, we're seeing. And I think the larger organizations, the NAMI, the CDC, you know, are, are tracking this and we'll soon really see some updated statistics. Um, we all have our own thoughts. We all have our own ideas, right? Um, of what we're seeing, what we're tracking. But when some of those new statistics come out on a national level, I think it'll be really eye-opening and continue pushing the conversation forward. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I just wanna pause and say both Dave with Intersect and Gabby with the Blue Dove Foundation have great newsletters that they send out with tons of resources. So when we send our follow-up email, we'll share links to those 
and they are something for you, whatever your role is to please share with your pastor, with your rabbi, with your community. And Gabby, can you tell us a little bit specifically about Blue Dove and how, you know, sort of like, what are the things you do to support faith communities as well as people with lived experiences? Sure. Um, so one of the areas we focus on is education. And for us, that's really important. It's again, looking at our faith and ways that we can connect it to the topic at hand, right? Mental health, addiction. Um, we are a resource creator. We are a programming organization. We're a content creator. And so we work with organizations and individuals across the country to bring these topics to life, to support individuals who want to talk about it. And we do that in different ways. Um, the Jewish holiday of Purim is coming up at the end of February. And we use a lot of times Jewish holidays as vehicles for connecting, teaching, understanding to these topics. And so we have several resources that are available for each of the Jewish holidays throughout the year that help bridge that gap, find that intersection. And we use Jewish values, we call them midot um, in, our, in our culture, in ways of learning. We look at rituals, we look at prayers of how we can pull out from that. We also offer different workshops that bring these ideas to life. And we also have a Jewish mental wellness toolkit that we've put together. And this is a resource that is great as a standalone resource that individuals um, can purchase or, or use. And it also goes along with some of our workshops. And what makes it you know, unique as opposed to other mental health toolkits that are out there is the Jewish connection piece. Mm -hmm. And so we bring the two uh, together there. And then where we really spend a lot of time is with storytelling, is with creating community, with working to eradicate shame and stigma. And it's how we were founded. Um, and one of our, our co-founders is actually on the call today. So it's great to see him um, here. And the idea of storytelling was our first program, we brought over 220 people together in the community to hear from real people who wanted to stand up in front of their community that they live in and share their personal stories. And what we learned from that is that individuals connect to other individuals so much more than hearing someone recount someone's story. And that within the community right here in Atlanta where we did those programs has truly opened up the conversation. And so by creating these ways and creating this openness, this sense of understanding and learning and support in our community, we're beginning to see a change. There's still a lot more to do, uh, but our resources and our tools are available both on an individual level and on a community level for organizations. And we'll, we'll share all, all the links to those amazing resources that you both have. So um, Shelly, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. We have one more question for both Dave and Gabby. And then we saw that there's some questions or comments in the chat box and, and we're gonna get to those next. Great, thank you. I'm just, I'm in awe of the work that you both are doing, <clears throat> excuse me, and appreciate it so much. And uh, let, let's hope that what programs such as these and so many and all the work that you're doing help to eradicate prejudice and discrimination, stigma that's imposed on, on people with mental health conditions and those who love them. So our last question is asking you both, what can faith communities do to provide support to people with mental health conditions and to those who love them as well, family members, caregivers. So Dave, would you like to take it first and then Gabby? Sure, I think one of the things that, that I'm a fan of is while it's beneficial and I'm a fan of people having separate ministries within a faith community for a particular area, 
to me, when I see an issue or an experience integrated throughout a particular congregation, for example, if a person is spending time publicly praying for people with mental health struggles, if they are using illustrations in their public teaching or preaching, making connections between one's faith and this area of mental health, if they are giving opportunities publicly for people to share their own stories of living with mental illness. These are all ways to me of normalizing and humanizing these experiences versus only seeing it as a separate area of ministry for a separate type of person. So the more that a leader and a community can integrate it into the processes it already has, to me, the more that helps families feel like they can come forward and share about their experiences. Thank, thank you, Dave. And this is really what you're talking about is, is belonging, not just inclusion. This is really what it means to belong, just like anyone else. And mm -hmm. that is, that's, I think, paramount in all of this work is to, for people to know that they are valued and cared for and loved. Gabby, how about you? Um, what can faith communities do to provide support to people with mental health conditions and those who love them? Well, first I have to just echo exactly what Dave said, because that was um, what, I, what I also agree with. And I think I've seen it time and time again, where you see somebody of influence in a community, right? Maybe it's a, a clergy member or a different leader, um, even, even a lay leader, right? A president of, of a congregation or something who has the strength to stand up and share a story, a connection, right? That influence breaks the silence, right? It, it opens up for conversation. When you see a rabbi share about losing a friend, you know, to suicide or whatever the topic might be, um, his, his congregants or their congregants come up to him and say, I didn't know I could talk to you about this, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know, thank you for sharing. And it just creates this, this sense of understanding of belonging, right? You guys were just talking about. Um, I also think on an individual level, we can all be you know, a little bit more educated, a little bit more knowledgeable, a little bit more empathetic to people, particularly you know, right now, we don't know what people are going through. You never know what someone's experiencing. And if we can just be welcoming and kind right, to people, um, say thank you, ask someone how they're doing, you know, that, that can actually really go a long, a long way, I think we see. Um, you know, in, in Judaism, we talk about the idea of tikkun olam, of repairing the world and making the world a better place. And I think that also goes along with some of what I was just saying, but there's another value and the idea of um, tikkun hanefesh, of heal the soul. And so I keep those two ideas in my mind constantly, right? And um, checking in with myself. I think as we're individuals and we go through all of this and we put more and more on ourselves, not to forget to check in with ourselves too, because um, we are a part of that community too. That's actually the perfect segue, Gabby, into some of the comments and questions. Emily had raised that. Um, asking about burnout for both of you, and Dave, I'll turn this to you. For those who work in faith communities, you know, this idea of taking care of yourself, being mindful of your own burnout. How are you coping with that, Dave? A lot that we could say, you know, certain practices that we find helpful. But I think as people who want to help others, there's a couple associated um, complementary things that I found helpful. One is, am I measuring success according to what's within my control? because sometimes as needs are amplified, I tend to think I'm only successful if I've met all the needs that have come in front of me, but I can't control other people's decisions. I can't control whether certain resources are available in the community. What I can do is control whether I'm giving my best. And kind of related to that, I have to ask myself, 
what's my identity rooted in? Is it rooted in my success as a professional or is my identity rooted in my faith? You know, for me as a Christian, is my identity rooted in Christ? Am I rooted in faithfulness to my calling and whether I am being faithful to what I can do given my various responsibilities in life? Or is my identity caught up in being seen as a successful person or as leading a successful program or initiative? So those aren't the practical, those might not be the practical, you know, am I getting enough sleep? Am I doing community right? Which is also important. But those are to me some of the more existential or um, ideological things I need to be paying attention to or else it's gonna show up in burnout. Yeah, really appreciate that, Dave. And Gabby, I think you spoke to that by addressing this idea of tikkun ha-nefesh, of, of caring for, starting from your soul. Um, so I have one more comment I wanna get to. Um, let me find it. <laughs> um, Barbara wrote, can we possibly talk about feelings? So the mental health community, um, so that the mental health community can connect better. And I'm not sure, Barbara, if there's anything more specific that you want to write about that, um, about what you're thinking of around feelings, but Yes, Dave, I'll open that up to you. Are, are, there, are there feelings that we, you know, maybe don't acknowledge that it would be helpful to bring into these dialogues? Um, well, one of the things that's interesting is, and I'm not sure this is going to meet Barbara with where she's at, but it strikes me that there aren't a lot of spaces for people that we serve with mental illness or professionals to talk about uh, issues of how they're feeling, such as hope and how that's been impacted in the pandemic, or where do I go? If I'm not connected to a faith community, I'm in the public mental health system, where do I go to talk about the big questions of life, like where I find meaning and purpose? And we've had spirituality groups in our organization and seen a lot of people come there because if they've been wounded in a faith community or aren't ready yet to go back, it's really helpful when there can be third spaces connected to our mental health system where people can bring up the big questions of life and talk about uh, not just symptoms of their own you know, uh, diagnosis, but about what they're actually feeling about life and about a loss of hope. I was just in a meeting this morning where professionals were talking about a loss of hope. So I do think there's a human dimension there for both people we serve and among mental health professionals that sometimes isn't tapped into that could create space to build this bridge between the topic of mental health and the topic of faith and how they actually are important both for people who are providing services and people who are receiving services. Thank you. Um, we have two more comments. Gabby, I'll ask you this. Um, Linda had raised were there any um, initiatives you've tried that have been unsuccessful and have you learned from them? I think as, as an organization, so we're, we're still pretty young, right? And so we're, we're in startup kind of mode, um, which is great because we get to be nimble, right? We get to, to try different things and learn from different things and adjust you know, to different things. Um, for us, I'd say you know, one place where we, we tried, we learned, um, was with some of the workshops that we've created. We always take the idea of piloting and of learning and evaluating. And so, um, you know, digitally, we've been able to expand that reach outside of um, in-person programming to virtual program over, over the last year. And so I think we always evaluate what we do. I, I, I wouldn't say there's something that we tried that we stopped doing because it didn't work, but there's always stuff that we try. We look at the feedback, we adjust, we tweak, and we, we, re, we reuse. Thank you. I, I have to say, we've got a couple more comments. We're, we appreciate 
um, Dave and Gabby staying and sharing. And I know for myself at our organization, just what you described that process, Gabby, is very healthy that you can try and you can evaluate. And I think, um, you know, many of us have expectations or in our organizations or faith communities that we're going to plan something and it's going to work out perfectly. And moving away from that paradigm that is so anxiety pr producing and saying, you know, sometimes we try things and, and the learnings in that. Um, Dave, we had a comment that is something I know when you spoke into groups for us, you've actually addressed this. And Ron shared that as a rabbi, he has, in a small community, he has had a balancing act of welcoming everyone into the house of worship and also ensuring that people feel safe and comfortable. And um, for example, there's, it sounds like someone who came and some of the ways that this person was acting made some women in the congregation not feel safe. And so I know you have spoken to this concern. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple things. One is the value of having people within your congregation building relationships with anyone who's coming in so that it's not just, hey, come in and take a seat, but there's someone who's built enough of a relationship that there's a relational capital there so that they can express concerns about maybe certain behaviors or actions. Um, in order to, you know, it, without that needing to go as south as it could, because there's trust behind that expression of concern. So that's one thing. Um, I think another is realizing that boundaries are okay, that we all set boundaries in our life, and that all of us have boundaries. Even our closest friends, we have still certain boundaries for them, and therefore, uh, even if we are going to be welcoming to people, it's okay to still say there are boundaries in order to help the common good of this congregation. That doesn't mean that they can never come back. It doesn't mean that they can never have opportunities to assimilate into the congregation, but that just we can say this is what community looks like here and say maybe for a period of time, if they're unable to integrate in that way, maybe there's individuals in our congregation that could reach out to them in love and be that expression of care. Even if it's not happening exactly in the corporate gathering, it could be happening in other ways throughout the week. So those are just a couple ways at it. That's great, Dave. And I, I love, you know, as both of your organizations too, you are resources, your co conversation partners. And so I would encourage, you know, clergies to, to reach out to Dave or to Gabby um, or someone in your community who can help you think through that. Um, one more question, Gabby, I'll give you this one. Are there ways that, I know the mental health system can be hard to navigate. Are there ways that faith communities could help someone navigate the system? Yeah, we've seen, you know, different examples. There are so many organizations across the country and synagogues we talk with and, and Jewish agencies. And I think um, there's, there's a few different thoughts. One, a lot of cities have what we call Jewish family services or Jewish family and career services who offer a lot of um, sliding scale counseling and a lot of other services. So, you know, to me, that's always a first start for anybody who needs direction, who's looking for support too. Um, they offer a lot of support there in terms of the overall mental health system. Um, and then, you know, we've seen synagogues that have mental health committees that have individuals who have gone through and become, you know, trained in um, mental health first aid, who have some more knowledge, who have said, you know, I want to give back to my community and I want to be a resource for people, right? And so they make themselves available to their congregation, to their friends, to their network of somebody who's there to help guide somebody, a shomer. Um, in, in Jewish a uh, guide to help them through understanding how to navigate a very complicated web, right, in, in some places. So building out programs, I think it's so important 
for leaders also in the community to know what are the resources in your community? Where can you direct somebody? Because it, it's tough, it's overwhelming, and the individual that's going through it is going through it at a really difficult time. Um, so having some people there to help support. That's awesome, thank you both. Shelly, I'll turn it back to you. All right, and this is screen share. Maybe. Let me just, there we there go. you go, perfect. There we go. Well, or jumping ahead of myself, which I do sometimes. There we go. Well, Gabby and Dave, Gabby and I can't thank you enough for being here today. I, I'm just going through everything you've talked about and just really am hopeful that step by step, this, you know, the things that we do are going to make a difference in someone's life and in the life of the community as well, which is really important. And um, just wanted to let everyone know that when, uh, when we're ready to post this particular episode on our website, we will be sending out the link. So you'll have that. You'll also have the information on Dave and Gabby, how to reach them and their organization. And uh, again, we are just so, so grateful and feel so blessed that you're here today with us and continued the opportunity. success. It's great. It's pleasure. great to see so many people show up for the conversation too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, yeah. Shelly and Gabby. Definitely. Well, we're going to turn our sights now to the next episode of Everyone's Welcome. And we hope you'll join us on February 23rd. That's a Tuesday at one o'clock Eastern time when an important conversation about faith communities advocating with people with disabilities and mental health conditions. Joining us will be Charles Clark, who is a core family member at Larsh Greater Washington, DC. And a core family member is the term used for adults with intellectual disabilities at Larsh at the Greater Washington, DC, Larsh. And Charles is a passionate advocate with a lot of experience in local politics. He also volunteers at the Arc of Northern Virginia on their communications committee and through their Alliance Liaison work. He's a musician, a singer, an avid player of the harmonica. Maybe he will entertain us as well. And also joining us will be Reverend Dr. Sarah Lund, Dr. Lund served as regional minister in the Florida Conference of the United Church of Christ and as a vice president for Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. Reverend Dr. Lund received the Dell Award for Mental Health Education at the 30th General Synod, Synod of the UCC. So probably someone, again, who will talk a bit about mental health and uh, she's a great resource. She's written two great books on mental health, one of which is coming out this year. Sarah is the Minister for Disabilities and Mental Health Justice on the national staff of the United Church of Christ. And she's also a senior pastor at First Congregational UCC of Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, we are expecting several other people to join us, just awaiting confirmation. We'll talk about the, the role that faith communities can play in this arena of advocacy, both at the, at the federal level and the local level. So we're very excited about that. And let's go to the next slide and Gabby. Sorry, I had a little Zoom glitch for a second. So um, again, we are so grateful to Dave and to Gabby and to all of you for, for joining us. And before we go, Shelly and I hope that you'll check out both of our books on your favorite online store. Both of our books are available as eBooks as well. And they're wonderful books for February to discuss in your community and of course beyond. 
And we invite you to forward the program information about everyone's welcome, the emails, the recordings to your colleagues, friends, families, and networks. We have a great lineup for the spring and the best way to get the word out about everyone's welcome is with your help. So we are grateful to you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on Tuesday, February 23rd, when we meet again for another Everyone's Welcome. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Take care. See you in two weeks.